It's July here at Monticello, and the temperature reaches into the 90s almost every day. But flowers like larkspur, blanket flower, and purple coneflower are blooming in our flower beds, and we're harvesting tomatoes, beans, and summer squash from the vegetable garden. What keeps our plants happy this time of year? Water. That's going to be our focus this episode. This is A Rich Spot of Earth, a podcast about gardening and the natural world. I'm Michael Tricomi, Interim Manager and Curator of Historic Gardens at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home in Albemarle County, Virginia. Thomas Jefferson built his home on a mountaintop for the incredible views, but that meant he sacrificed easy access to water. Recently, I sat down to talk about water with our curator of plants, Peggy Cornett, and our flower gardener, Debbie Donnelly. Watering or irrigation in Jefferson's day was challenging, I think. Monticello's water sources were very sparse. The closest major water source was the Ravana River, which is at the bottom of the mountain, about a mile away. Jefferson's enslaved workers would have to gather water from various sources, including springs that are around the mountain when they were flowing, which always wasn't the case. (laughs) The wells would go dry. We believe that there were periods during drought times when there were lots of failures in the garden because of the lack of water. If any watering was done, and it was done by the enslaved workforce, and they were hauling barrels of water from the river and from the cisterns, they would have to use buckets to water each plant or run it through a little trough into the garden. It was an enormous amount of work. It's a lot of work with modern hoses, let alone if you had to go collect it at the spring or the river. I can't imagine. (laughs) No, it was very difficult. And of course, you're trying not to lose a lot of water while you're transporting it up the mountain, too. That, again, is another challenge. Jefferson designed a system for collecting rainwater in underground cisterns. They were constructed from brick and lined with mortar to make them waterproof. Gutters from the house were channeled into four cisterns that were on each corner of the terraces. They had very ingenious gutters. They were called Philadelphia gutters, so they were inside the roof line. You didn't see gutters hanging out like most people have on their houses. It was buried into the architecture of the house. The water ran down into a series of troughs that ran beneath the terrace boards and funneled into these cisterns. And there was even a well pump that we've restored that's quite ingenious. It would pump the water out of the cistern. But the mortar was not as good as it could have been, so the cisterns would leak. It wasn't as waterproof as as you would like. He also had an amazing plan to channel water from a spring on Montalto, the big mountain above Monticello, and he wanted to channel spring water in a series of aqueducts down the mountain <laughs> and then over to Monticello to water the vegetable garden. It would also create a beautiful waterfall coming down Montalto. This was a dream that was never even realized or even begun to realize, but it was a pretty cool idea. An aqueduct stretching from Montalto to Monticello would have been amazing. Now let's talk about watering plants. How do you know when a plant needs water? Plants, they usually tell you. (laughs) I mean, they flag their leaves droop. You can see it in just newly transplanted seedlings to trees all the way up. One other way to tell if a plant is too dry, I know that leaf curling we see in the vegetable garden, especially in corn, and tomatoes, you'll get that curling of the leaves and that'll be a a sign that they're very thirsty. I think the leaves are almost trying to reduce the surface area that's transpiring the the moisture in it, so they curl up a bit. July can be one of those months where you could get good rainstorm and then just a period of long, dry weather. High temperatures. You can time your work schedule around the weather and what the plants need. You don't want to water in the middle of the day because so much evaporates. If you have to plant in dry soil, it's good to get it wet ahead of time and then also make sure the plant you're putting in the ground, the roots are hydrated before you plant those tender roots into really dry soil. It's tough on the plant. I have been transplanting a number of coxcomb and 
fall, some things like that that have self-sown. I have been following my mother's advice. She would always dig a hole and put water in it before the plant went in. Got out of the habit of doing that, but when I was transplanting this poor little shock coxcombs from one area to another, I would dig the hole, put the water in, and then put the plant in, and then water it again. Good technique. And then I always make sure I water it yet again the next morning. It also helps if you don't try to transplant too large of a plant. You want to get that nice, big, beautiful one, but they do suffer a lot more because it's more plant that the roots have to sustain. Smaller plants really catch up to what would be bigger plants and they don't struggle as much. It's good practice to go with the smaller ones. If your plants are drooping, water them immediately. But you don't want to water a little bit every day. You want to water thoroughly and then wait until dry to encourage the roots to reach down into the soil for moisture. That produces good, strong roots. In our greenhouses here at Monticello, we grow a lot of plants from seed. You need to be careful watering seedlings and potted plants. If you have a potted plant, you can tell by lifting the pot. And if it's very light, it needs water and trays, and then put the flats in there so that they soak up the water. I would that's, say that's the best way. That's yeah. the best way. Definitely. Yeah. They can get limp if they're overwatered, too. <laughs> and if they're sitting in too much water for too much time, you'll start to see signs yeah. of fungus, fungus gnats. My mother used to say, <laughs> give it a good drink of water and then leave it alone. She'd wait a week or so before she'd water again. I've always been guilty of overwatering. When you take a young plant out of the pot, the top would appear quite dry, but I was amazed at how much water was actually down towards the bottom of those roots. So I've had to mend my ways. Yeah, you want the plants to reach a little bit with their roots. If they are too wet, they don't have any reason to grow vigorously or too deep. Letting them dry out is definitely a good idea. That's what I do with my house plants. If they look like they might need water, I wait a week. <laughs> now we're going to talk about some plants that Lewis and Clark brought back from their exploration of the western United States from 1803 to 1806. Jefferson, then president, commissioned their expedition. We do have a number of plants in the garden that are fairly drought resistant. A lot of the plants that were brought back by Lewis and Clark were plants from the plains, such as the narrow-leafed echinacea that's called the mad dog plant. It's a member of the coneflower genus, and they have really deep roots. The Latin name is Echinacea angustifolia. If you're wondering how it came to be called mad dog plant, it was used as medicinal, and at one time people thought it could cure rabies. One of my favorites is Gallardia, or blanket flower. It's a beautiful daisy-like flower, but it's orange and red and yellow. Very drought tolerant once it's established. It is a perennial, but it will self-sow also. So there are lots of them that come up from the parent plant. They are one that benefit from deadheading. You cut the spent flowers off and then it just encourages plant to put more flowers out. Lewis's prairie flax is another absolutely beautiful plant. It's a sky blue flower. The foliage is a blue-green color, and it's very fine and feathery. It's just a really nice plant that also will self-sow. We have them sowing into the winding walk, which is rock. <laughs> That's just a sky blue flower. I think it's such a lovely blue. Very pretty. You can see it all the way across the garden. They bloom late spring, but then they do continue to bloom off and on throughout the season as well. And it was named after Meriwether Lewis. People were honored with the naming of plants. There's an annual flower that was named after William Clark called Clarkia. Elkhorn flower is another name. It's harder to grow because I think it gets too hot too fast. They're just fussy, but they're beautiful. And there's pinks and white. The foliage is quite delicate. They call them elkhorn flowers because the shape of the petals look like tiny little elk horns, <laughs> or reindeer horns. But a lot of these plants, even though they're drought resistant, you have to remember that if they're newly transplanted, they still need water until they get 
acclimated and start growing their roots. Even in wintertime, trees and shrubs need water, at least the first year. Jefferson once said, the greatest service which can be rendered any country is to add a useful plant to its culture. So botanical discovery was an important goal of the Lewis and Clark expedition. For the crops that were brought back by Lewis and Clark, he was really trying to introduce edible, useful crops like the ericara bean. Ericara bean, mandan corn. The ericara bean is doing great in the garden right it's now. It's doing really well. Yeah. They had very few pods on them on a Friday, and then we came back again on Monday, and it was full of pods. Oh, so wonderful. I think we had rain over that weekend. It really took off. Lewis and Clark went to Fort Mandan. They encountered the native tribes, the Arikara, the Hadassah, and the Mandan native people. These beans were called the Arikara or Arikara bean. It's a little bush bean. It's a nice bush habit, nice green pods on them. But the bean itself is a dark yellow, you know, Arikara yellow bean. Sometimes you'll hear it called. So is it more of a dried bean for soups and things like that? You could eat it eat dried, them. but I have snack on them when, when they're green as well. <laughs> yeah, they're a great green bean. I've never eaten them green because we are always growing the seed. Fix us some for lunch, Michael. Yeah, let's have it. Let's do it. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, Beans. there's a beautiful squash we grew years ago. I think the Hadatsa squash. It's yeah, variegated. It's gorgeous. Yes. Oh, I hope we get that back. It's yes, beautiful. Yes, we're, we're yeah. trying to grow that for this year. Good. So. The interesting thing about the corn crops is that they were selected to grow in a very short season. So they actually mature on about a five-foot plant because they didn't have a long summer. You think of corn being 12 feet tall or something. The Mandan red clay corn that we grow in the garden is four to five feet tall and produces ears very fast. The Mandan sunflower is beautiful. Those tower over a lot of the other things we have in the vegetable garden. They are really impressive, massive heads. They have to them. be sown when it's cooler weather, I think. They do really well yeah. sown late spring. I read somewhere that they are typically sown when the frost is beginning to melt in the Dakotas. And they self-sow. Speaking of self-sowing, in Lewis and Clark, there was a lot of salsify that we saw coming oh. up. Yeah, they self-sow just about everywhere. I think that's another one I've never eaten. You would eat the root. It's similar to a carrot in the length and shape of the root. Oyster plant used to be called. Definitely has a distinct flavor to it. We need lunch, Michael. Yeah, we need yes. to have a... <laughs> the Rick <laughs> Ravines and Salsify. Lewis and Clark lunch. Can make a soup. It's, yeah, it's lost favor with people, I think. It's just one of those lost vegetables that you see only in certain historic gardens. It looks farms. like a parsnip, doesn't it? It's similar. Yeah, it's pretty white. I love parsnips. Are they the ones that can give you the phyto... What yes, you, uh, unfortunately, I've experienced that before. Yeah. The parsnip, too. The leaves, yeah. Yes, yeah. That's another issue with hot weather is you can have skin reactions to some of these plants, especially when you're sweating and your oils are on the surface of your skin. You get a contact dermatitis from some of these plants. Figs. Even squashes and things like that. It looks like I've been burnt on my arms. It doesn't hurt, but it discolors your skin. We were harvesting parsnips from the garden, and uh, I had short sleeves and wearing gloves, and afterwards I'd notice a rash on my forearms. Learn the hard scars. way a lot of times. Yeah. I remember that happened a few years ago. One of our employees looked like an alien. Oh, my. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> Make right. sure you're wearing gloves and long sleeves when you harvest those. As far as harvesting from the garden, anything that's leafy or more delicate, I would definitely recommend doing that in the morning when it's cooler. Otherwise, that'll just wilt as soon as you pull it out of the ground. Oh, another big thing we're starting to do this month is a lot more seed saving. Our peas have gone to seed, our spinach, brassicas, all things like that. We're starting to harvest and save them. Ideally, they're harvested on a dry day. This way, the seed isn't damp to begin with. But yeah, just letting them dry out a little bit further in the greenhouse and then breaking that down so that we can store it. I've been doing the same thing. The columbine is nearly all finished with producing seed. The bachelor's buttons, it's always a race to get to them before the goldfinches do. The sweet william, we've yeah. also been harvesting that, and I'm actually starting to pull out sweet william plants because they're pretty done. But then come August, when it's so beastly hot, my enthusiasm wanes. <laughs> but then September, we start getting some more rain. It's cooler temperatures, and mm -hmm. the roses are putting out buds again. It just gets right. you revitalized and ready to keep at it. 
Here's some recent Monticello visitors. Hi, I'm Cosette. I'm from North Dakota. Hi, my name is Julia, and I'm Cosette's mother. I came to Monticello to learn more about the history and more about Thomas Jefferson. And we wanted to learn more about Monticello because all of the students are reading the new book, My Monticello, and we just finished reading it. And so we're very excited to learn more about the history here, both of Thomas Jefferson and of Sally Hemings and all of the inhabitants who used to live here. Our horticulturist Robert Dowell joined Peggy to talk about an interesting tree that Lewis and Clark documented out west. Maclura pomifera is a scientific name, and Osage orange is the common name. Osage refers to a Native American tribe in Missouri and the Arkansas region. This tree is in the mulberry family. Moraceae is the scientific name. And a common feature of plants in that family is they often leak a white milky sap. Figs will often do this, mulberries will definitely do this, and if you ever prune a Maclura pomifera, you'll notice the same thing. It was one of the first seedlings Lewis and Clark brought back to Jefferson in 1804. It became one of the most planted trees in America because you could hedge it down, and it has thorns, and so it's like an impenetrable fence. This was before barbed wire was invented. Right, they are quite thorny, and they can form an intense thicket. But also, the wood has an incredible elasticity. The Native Americans really revered it because it was used for bows. So the name that the French gave it was the Bois d'Arc, or B-O-I-S, D apostrophe A-R-C, which is bow wood. But then that became corrupted into bow d'Arc, which is B-O-D-A-R-K, which is just a common name. It's a very tough, adaptable tree. Very tough. So it's, it can take full sun, it can take very windy conditions, high heat. Its native range is in Oklahoma, Missouri, and northeastern Texas, which can be a very dry, hot, windy, sometimes desolate area. An interesting fact that I learned today is that one of the national champions of Osage Orange, which is the largest specimen of its kind in the United States, is located in Virginia in Charlotte County at Patrick Henry's estate. It's a tree that is, or was at one point not too long ago, 60 feet by 64 feet, which is much larger than they occur in the wild typically. They used to think that the first ones brought east were by Lewis and Clark, but they've determined by that tree that the Native Americans must have brought it back much exactly. earlier. Exactly, yes, because when Patrick Henry bought the property, the tree was already 100 years old. Oh, that's incredible. The other interesting thing about the Bodark or the Osage Orange is that they're male and female trees. The females make this kind of a grapefruit-like fruit. You'll see it along roadsides, just down the road from Monticello, and the fruit's are out on the road in, at right. certain times of the year. <laughs> the seed is almost like a citrus seed. The fruit itself is like a compound structure of multiple fruits fused together. And if you were to cut one open, it would just exude that white, sticky sap. And they're just very messy. But then the male trees get very stately. There's a huge Osage orange at the Morvan Estate, for example, just down the road. The bark gets very deeply grooved and it's very tall, a magnificent tree. If you have a male and a female tree that are able to cross-pollinate, you might have a small population, but they're not a threat like autumn olive or ailanthus or any of the more serious species. Definitely not a wind-borne fruit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peggy and Robert also discussed the snowberry bush. Another Lewis and Clark plant that was brought back was a shrub. It came from the west coast and it bore these beautiful white berries that was brought to Jefferson, who sent the seed on to Bernard McMahon in Philadelphia, and he was successful in growing the shrub. The Latin name is Symphoricarpos albus, snowberry bush. And they're very plump. They look like a berry that's been inflated almost. Jefferson sent seedlings to his friend Madame de Tesse in Paris. He was sending her lots of our native plants. He said, it's an object of singular beauty. It may never have gotten to her. I'm not sure if she was actually alive when it got to her. People in those days were shipping things back and forth, even though they may not have known someone might have died. I think that was the case with the snowberry. Robert wanted to mention one last tree. It has nothing to do with Lewis and Clark, but it's blooming now, the American chestnut. It's one of our great trees of the eastern forests. Unfortunately, a pathogen 
by the name of Cryphonectria parasitica, accidentally introduced in New York in the early 20th century, has spread throughout the entire native range of the American chestnut and wiped out nearly all of it, at least large mature specimens. It was an Asian pathogen? Yeah, a lot of times these plant pathogens are introduced accidentally through the transfer of plant material from one continent to another. It's a story that's played out many times, sadly. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But thankfully, many trees are still alive and they're in the forest. If you're hiking in the woods in Virginia, particularly the western side, you can often see the American chestnut, but it won't be as a tree, it'll be as a shrub. What'll happen is it'll try to become a tree and it will send up stems and inevitably those stems will be girdled by the pathogen and die back, but the roots are still alive. And so there's this constant renewal of vegetation coming from the base of the plant, but they're still quite abundant. Occasionally, one of those stems might get tall enough that it actually blooms, and this is the time of year when you see those blooms, if you're lucky enough, they might even be big enough to fruit, but that's still quite rare. It was an important tree at Monticello. The wood was very plentiful here, and a lot of the house of Monticello was built with chestnut wood. And the fences, there was so much of it that they could make a paling for all the fences, including the fence that went around the vegetable and, and fruit garden, which was three quarters of a mile in length and 10 feet high, used for firewood. I'm, it was everywhere. The nuts from the tree was so important for wildlife. And so it was an terrible loss for many reasons. They were enormous trees. It must have been so heartbreaking. It's sort of like what we're going through now with the dying of a lot of the large ash trees from the emerald ash borer that I hope we can somehow stave off because mm. <laughs> those trees get quite large mm. too. There are isolated cases where resistant trees exist and even can reproduce. But there are so few and far in between, and in order to wait for those resistant trees to repopulate the range of the native chestnut, we would have to wait 5,000 years. There is an organization called the American Chestnut Foundation that is trying to expedite the process, and they're back crossbreeding American chestnuts with Chinese chestnuts, which are resistant to this disease. And uh, they're making big progress. You can check out their work at www.acf.org. That's it for July. Thanks for listening and check us out in August.